technical development team here at IIRSM. Today's speaker is Andy Neal, Director of Global Security Solutions at Cardinus Risk Management, where he provides a range of clients with training in corporate travel safety. Before I hand over to Andy, I just need to run through a few housekeeping type things. Um, so first of all, you'll be on mute for the duration of the webinar. However, if you have any questions, please feel free to type these in the chat function on the bottom right hand corner of the screen and Andy will pick those up at the end of his presentation. And secondly, the webinar is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be available on IIRSM's YouTube channel after the event. OK, Andy, over to you. Okay, just put these headphones on. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so we're going to talk about corporate travel risk and uh, what I would term protecting your most valuable assets. Um, I often hear um, people talking about safety within their own buildings, e.g. access and egress and security on the doors, but often what's often overlooked is the traveling staff. Um, staff deployed to different countries um, for business or for um, any other factors um, and what the procedures are and processes and one of the questions we always ask is what are the processes and procedures you have within your organization I'm going to as you're sitting there listening to me I'm going to ask you to think about that what, what are your procedures and your policies for your traveling staff so we'll move to the next slide assets versus people and we'll move on so in effect have, have you what we're going to look at is have you ever been to a location or looked at a person and thought to yourself that things don't feel quite right if you ask anybody in any any locations where they travel is you know do they feel comfortable in the environment that they're operating in or they're working in we often hear stories of people traveling um, arriving at an air, airport late and their designated driver's not there, or people holding up their name card. So often people feel, don't feel comfortable in an environment. So part of this program I'm gonna to talk to you today is A, looking at some of the procedures um, that you can give to your staff, and B, give you some kind of skills, uh, little tips and little tricks what to look for when you you personally are traveling or something that you can relate to your to your staff as they are moving forward so many factors influence travel um, pressures of work um, commitments to um, projects um, so we often hear that a risk manager has traveling staff and they typically go on a monitoring station or a monitoring tools which come back that the destination is of medium to high risk I've just recently returned from Mexico and I, I one of the questions Mexico City uh, one of the questions I asked all of the delegates we trained there was you know how many of you have ever been um, blown up and no hands were raised how many of you have ever been shot at uh, one hand was raised how many of you have been held up at gunpoint four or five hands were raised and how many of you have ever been robbed a dozen hands were raised and how many of you were ever kidnapped three hands went up and the health and safety managers blood was draining from his face because this was all hidden information that this particular company had no uh, idea at all about what was happening to their traveling staff on the ground in the area so a lot of pressure was mounted which then stopped them listening or reacting to a policy and procedures and keeping the company aware of what's happening on the ground so the first thing i'm going to ask you to think about is what do you do before you travel what checks do you do and how does this affect the people around you so when we talk about checks often we hear of travel management companies where you book your um, staff to travel and they sit in a nice aircraft and they fly from A to B and it will give them details of their hotel and what the weather's like. I often ask a, a, a set of different questions which we're going to come on to which is which is practical things that people need to know when they land in the environment that they're going to work be working into. So 
what we're going to look at is the important first checks of what we can do. So pre-planning checks. Just, again, ask you a question to think about how many pre-planning checks do you have within your organization? I've put here in front of you floors one to five. And what do we mean by floors one to five? And often I get asked requests that uh, a, an international group of senior managers are meeting in a, in a location, for example. So we would say that you only book your senior management in between floors one and five or any of your personnel when you book uh, hotels between floors one and five. And if I was looking at you now, I'd probably see some quizzical thoughts on your face thinking why only floors one and five. Well, statistically, the ground floor on buildings are the highest risk for break-ins and robberies. Um, and typically, every fire appliance in the world reaches the fifth floor. So why, as a part of your policy, do you put your senior executive team on the 15th and the 16th floor? And if there was that building was compromised, could they effectively get out of the building? So that's one of the policies that we put in place is that nobody goes above the fifth floor. Also, we look at is embassy locations and contact details of the embassy. And this can be for various things. It could be if any of your staff uh, get in trouble with the police or arrested overseas. It could be that it's in an area of earthquake or monsoon or even some kind of medical conditions like malaria. And so does the embassy or the, con the consulate of your specific country know that you are uh, in the country at any one time? The third list that we've got there is what we call medical supplies, what, meaning medical supplies. So um, typically in the UK or France or Italy or Germany, if you had an accident on the side of the road, you would expect a, a very good professional medical services to turn up. But what about in the middle of Africa or the middle of Brazil or some of the more wider spread countries? What type of medical supplies or um, service do you attend? Um, so what is the medical uh, infrastructure of the countries that you're traveling to? Is it good medical practice? Is it private or is it municipal? And you may find in certain countries, municipal hospitals are not sterilized equipment. The risk of infection is enormous. So think about, do you issue any of your staff medical supplies? Uh, I'm going to go back to Mexico where we issued a medical trauma um, packs. Uh, that being because of the risks of, of small arms shooting from drug cartels was high. We issued them all a medical pack to go in their equipment. And then if we drop down the list, then we look for more generic information. Where are the nearest hospitals to where your staff will be staying? Where's the nearest police stations? And when we talk about the police, um, obviously we're from the UK at the moment. If I went into north of the UK, the police officers will wear the same uniforms. Um, so I pose a question to you. What do the police look like in Brazil? What's the color of uniforms? What's the color of their vehicles? Because you have local police, regional police, and national police. Um, local police, traditionally, not very well paid uh, and often can be corrupt. Uh, the regional police, um, better trained, uh, still effective, um, but you'll get a better service. And the national police are very well trained and you can expect a very high level of service to you. So what colors of uniforms are the police forces? So if you're walking down the street and you see a local police team working with something and you think to yourself, I may get pulled into that incident, so you may you know, train your teams to move to a different location. Cultures are also big. Again, what do you know about the cultures that you're going into and you're rep representing? So that's, a, that's another area, and I would advise you to go on your own country's um, government websites which give some pretty good details about the cultures of specific countries that you're going to so pre-planning and pre-checking cultures and, and habits are, are, are very good um, organized if, if, if there 
is there any is it an organized trip for example i would ask you a question is how many hilton hotels are there in central paris and how many hilton hotels are there in rio de janeiro and so often if we've given your staff hotels to um, go to go on the internet and get a quick downloaded picture of the front of the hotel i've done it myself long journey got into a taxi drove to to the hotel got out and i'm at the wrong hotel i'm at a different hotel in a different part of the city so just orientate yourself for the city that you're working in and also carry the correct equipment the batteries are you are you do you have any portable batteries to charge your phones um do you have um, i always carry head torches and medical equipment as we said so i have a little pack with me because in a case of an emergency like an earthquake or a flood typhoon then we have an emergency pack that we can carry with us if we need to get out of the situation to move through the slide now so now we're going to really once we've planned our trip we're going to give you a sort of reading situations which is a proactive approach to reading situations so it's a kind of a toolkit of support and often um, if I would speak to you about how how do you risk assess situations so you fly into a different country how do you risk assess situations and most people will risk assess using um, three things where they've been brought up how they've been brought up and their values um, and, and often your values may not match the values of the country that you're going to. So we train people to work to a system so that they can risk assess properly in any environment, whether it's um, unsupported environment or a normal country. And we call it uh, fizzy bottles, thinking about what pressures are you under when you are working. So, for example, if you imagine I had a, a bottle of two bottles of Coca-Cola now, and I gave you one bottle and asked you to open it, you'd open it quite freely. But if I shook the second bottle and then asked you to uh, open that bottle, you would open it very differently and you'd open it quite slowly so you don't get the content spill up all over you like this picture shows. So we open different bottles of um, Coca-Cola differently depending on the pressure. But why do we not do that with people? Why do we not do that? Why? Do we not look for risks in a methodical way so that we reduce the risk of our traveling staff? And we move on to the next slide, which will talk about reading people and emotions. So this is a, you know, one of the things that um, a lot of uh, training companies do is they train the staff to, staff to react to situations. Um, I always find that quite difficult because you're training them to react to a situation and most of the time 99 percent of the time their travels are relatively risk-free so i like to go on the lines of training people to read situations have a proactive approach is to read situations and not get into those situations in the first place and so this next section that we're going to talk about is give you a few tips on what to look for when any of your staff are traveling or in fact yourself are traveling and what to look for when people are at risk few little indicators we're going to go through now the question I'm going to ask you is how do you read people and that's a, it's a very difficult question actually because people don't read people they don't watch people I've just traveled into central London now and I'm watching people on the tube train with their earphones on looking at their mobile phones nobody's watching anybody really everybody's buried in their own little environment and again as you can see tube stations rail uh, airports is, is quite a, uh, an area of risk that we have to be aware of around us so I find it fascinating that people just more interested in what's on their phones and on their iPods rather than what's actually around them what we look at is size um, people always say to me is is um, you know you can't judge a book by its cover but from a risk perspective we do judge a book by its cover what's the size of the person so if you see somebody in a disturbed state how big are they how strong are they are we are you able to deal with them effectively or are you not and genders we talk about genders are, are quite interesting males and females are, are are different the way we read risk in fact if we go into a little detail males are very distance focused we we uh we, we see things um 
very focally and very distant and we read body language as a matter of interest from four regions of our brain so we're very distance focused and very restricted in our vision when we come into serious and difficult situations where ladies are much more uh, aware of surroundings um, they read body language from 17 regions of their brain very very effective on, uh, at reading situations around them so um, how males and females react in difficult situations is um, a very different um, statistically i would say uh, that ladies are more at risk from being compromised in difficult situations e.g um, say civil disturbance or uh, flooding or um, fire than men and because i can't see you i'm going to ask you the question of why are ladies more at risk of being compromised in difficult situations than men and you may be thinking to yourself well uh, females are, the way they approach things are different and males are very different and there's no statistics in any situation that actually um, states that females are any different to males physically or mentally in difficult situations the main reason that females are more at risk is what they wear on their feet so um, i'm sure some of you who live in the cities wear the flat soled shoes when you're out and you get into your nice shoes when you're in the office the things like um, we advise not to wear slip-on shoes uh, always laced shoes uh, not to wear high heels when, when they're traveling and certain things again is things for the males as well is so what type of clothing do you carry or do you wear when you're overseas so have a thought about that about issuing um, information about the appropriate clothing when traveling also what about cultures cultures of countries that you're visiting um, as we all know in business cultures is a, is a huge area so we, we don't talk too much about cultures but what we do know is is we must how we shake hands and how we react to people is very different so do a bit of history and a bit of work on, on cultural diversity it goes a long way when you're within your traveling um, teams age is a factor as well um, we look at age young and old sort of attitudes are, are, are very different through through age and it's all to do with brain development and how, how people react so again um, looking at somebody what's the age of the person I would say to you what's the higher risk a young person or an older person now I would you can't see me but I'm 50 years of age thankfully this year but I, I can't remember when I last lost my temper because I'm I'm more mature now I'm older so I act, actually can control my behaviors so if you're in a, a situation a transport hub or in a in a shopping center or in a restaurant and you see an older person and start to lose their temper and start to become hostile just think to yourself that there's probably lots of things gone on external to that situation that has caused that behavior so sometimes older people are the higher risk uh, when it when it comes to hostility body language I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about body language uh, a little bit of detail now so we're gonna move through to the next slide so what we're gonna do is focus in on body language and it's the first system of defense I'm going to give you some practical tools that when you are on the ground and when in any location and what to look for so um, staring I'm going to ask you a question again how many of you can feel when somebody's staring at you and I would expect you're all thinking yep I can I can uh, recognize when somebody's staring at me. So what do you do when somebody stares at you? That's the next question I'll ask you. Okay, so we'll move through. So I just want you to look at this picture on the left and just uh, have a look and, and try and think to yourself, you know, what, what's his mood? Do you think he's uh, aggressive? I'm trying to write with this pen, which is uh, <laughs> not, I hope you can see that. at that how cool am i um look, what we're looking at is is what's his mood just think to yourself what is his mood um so what i'm going to say to you is, is uh what's wrong with this picture um what's wrong with this picture um meaning 
first of all, we'll talk about the ape. Are, are you as strong as an ape? And we use the ape, we use a chimpanzee because it's the closest known um, relative to human beings. Uh, and a chimpanzee is, is actually 18 times stronger than man. It's more powerful than us. Uh, is it faster than us? Yes, a, a, a chimpanzee is three times as fast as a human being, unless you're Usain Bolt, of course. And uh, is it more agile? Yep, apes are much more agile than humans. So it has three defense systems. So what it, what's wrong with this picture? And what's wrong with this picture is uh, actually human beings, because we lost strength and agility, we actually um, are one of the only animals in the animal kingdom whose majority of our eyes are white. And if you look at a true ape, True apes and most of the animal kingdom have no whites of the eyes. In fact, their eyes are black and brown. We don't know if it's um, passive, aggressive, or defensive. So what's wrong with this picture over here is what it's done is it's given them human eyes. And so the first line of defense, the first line of any of the, the training that we uh, look for is, is we start to recognize when their eyes become hostile. And that's why you picked up the mood. So if you think about it, the first line of defense is when somebody is looking at you. And that's what we look for. So my next question is, at what distance can you detect somebody staring at you? And there is a, there is a distance that we use, which is uh, approximately uh, 30 feet. Beyond 30 feet or 10 meters, you do not get the visual uh, impression of stairs because the vision's too far. And so this 30 feet we use a lot as we train people to work within the 30 feet. In fact, everything we talk about when they're overseas, when they're traveling is they've got 30 feet or 10 meters to make a decision whether to break progress towards somebody or to move across the road or to sit in a different location or to turn around and that's critical so we will start to see that these eye movements can be seen within 10 meters and that's a critical point so what do you do when somebody's staring at you uh, if i was with you now i'd be pointing at you and telling you what you do most people uh when somebody stares at them instantly look down and it's a diffusing tactic that humans use is to show that uh, we're not aggressive. So we look down. But it's also actually something that actually shows that we are in weakness. And so if somebody stares at you and you look down, what does it show? It means that you're vulnerable. And it, again, if we go back that the first line of vulnerability is when somebody's looking at you. If you... Uh, we've researched most street robberies in most cities in the world and the street robbery gangs will say we know who our victims are straight away as soon as we look at them and so if you ask yourself if you look down what I, I don't want you to do is you never ever ever look down when somebody stares at you you basically are inviting a contact you're inviting them to come and either continue with their hostility towards you or you become vulnerable so what I want you to do is when somebody stares at you is actually raise this triangle upwards as we can see in the uh, in the book here what I want you to do is when somebody stares at you you look above their heads up to the top of the head up here what this says to them is that it's a reverse psychology it's a very powerful thing to do so if you're walking down the street and you see somebody looking at you within our 30 feet or in across a hotel lobby within our 30 feet and they're staring at you and you feel that feeling what I want you to do is just move your head above them you go above their heads this is basically saying to them that you're in control and you are not their victim it's the same in the animal kingdom if you ever get a dog coming towards you you never look down from a dog because as far as the dog's concerned you're a weaker dog than he is or she is what you do is you go above them and if you go above their head you'll often see the dog's head drop down because you're dominating them so that's one of the little tricks that we use and this often um, stops people like beggars aggressive beggars it stops people canvassing on the streets it stops people approaching you because you're telling them without saying anything i am not a victim and i am not approachable today as we move through. So then we're going to look for some
keen body language movements again within 10 meters so i'm not sure if any of you in the office and we always do it's a freeze frame if you just freeze frame and just look around the room i often do it when i'm on trains i just stop and just look around and i just watch people's body language i'm looking for what we call natural versus negatives what do people look like naturally or negatively now interestingly one of our key areas is actually when we land into a location statistics show that within a five kilometer area of an airport you're 40 percent more likely of being compromised by uh, robberies and things like that and often they pick up their victims as they walk through the arrivals lounge because you're more interested in 4g on your phone than watching people so one of the techniques we train is to watch people as you're going through and basically you're saying to them you're alert and you're not worthy of being followed so often I look and I look around and I see what does people's body language look like. So I'm going to give you a, a little tip here, which is which is quite important. Um, uh, how do you read a book? Uh, most people read from left to right. So from a very young age, we read a book from left to right. And that's how you view things. So when you go into a train station or an airport hub you or into a bar or into a restaurant, you read from left to right and the brain actually skips information so what i want you to do is train your staff or or yourselves is to do the opposite is we read from right to left and that you'll find is your brain will not skip information it actually slows the brain down so you don't miss information it's quite difficult to do to start with but when you're observing a restaurant or a hotel lobby or or an area you read from right to left and you pick up uh, a lot more risk indicators reading it that way rather than doing how we naturally look is left to right what i've put on here is um what we call arm faults we're going into into reading people the lady on the left and a person on the right and what's the difference um you'll ask yourself why do you fold your arms well if you go back to the animal kingdom the, the most vulnerable part of a four-legged animal is its throat humans our most vulnerable part is our core and so we are designed naturally, even the way you stand in queues is designed to protect this core. And if you look at the lady on the left, she's doing something quite natural, which is protecting her core. But also what we're looking for on this lady is the hands open. When we see the hands open anthropologically, it tells us that she is, her thought process is that of comfort. It actually comes from infancy where they cuddle themselves. So what we always look for when people have arm folds is that can we see the hands? Are the hands open? This picture on the right, we can't see the hands. And I would indicate probably that these hands are closed. So it tells me that there is uh, a slight hostility or a more defensive pattern of this person on the right. So what I'm not going to do is sit with my back to that person. I'm going to sit so that I can observe them uh, and, and make sure that their body language doesn't increase risk. So what we're going to look for then is, is, is what we call head tilts. If you watch people who are relaxed, mostly their heads will tilt over to the, to the left or to the right. It's anthropological. It's next to the mother's breast. It's a calming effect in humans. And if you watch people in a room, uh, when they're concentrating, their heads will not be over to the left. If they're quite relaxed and no, no thought pro process or difficult, you'll see their heads will be tilted over. And we can look for that, which means they've got a natural learned behavior which is a head tilt here we see a dog with its heads tilted over it's listening go back to these negative signs here we see their arms closed which is very important start looking for that if you're if you're walking down the road and you see a person stood on the stood on their sidewalk or on the on the pavement and you've got those type of mechanisms just think to yourself that that is a more defensive look so be cautious and remember you've got 30 feet 10 meters to make a decision about those people the other thing that we look for which is really really interesting is what we call the pile activation this is very very important and i really want you to concentrate on this what does a dog do when you first approach it if you watch a dog the first thing it does is it drops its chin so it's protecting its most vulnerable area humans do what these people are doing on the left they fold their arms it's very protect this is a protective posture if you watch very carefully on the back of a dog what you'll see 
is the dog you see the fur on the back of its neck rise it's called the pile activation now the pile activation is is an instinctive area of a dog and you'll see the fur rise on the back of its neck um, in humans we don't have fur on the back of our necks anymore um, but what we have is an ancient nerve called the pile erectus and when people are becoming hostile agitated very defensive what you'll see is their hand go to the back of their neck three or four times what i'm going to say to you is is you never ever ignore that you've probably seen it in meetings you know if you do you understand the process and you'll see the hand and it's a definite movement the hand will go to the back of the neck and it's where where we used to have for millions of years ago and it's, it's where our nerves are still there so we still react to it i think this is probably one of the the, the key areas that you can train your staff to watch for Again, if you're walking down the road and you see somebody staring at you and the hand goes to the back of the neck, um, I would indicate that you have to do something actually to reduce that risk and either return to your location, cross the road, but you do not walk into that risk. We also look for things like uh, lip biting. It's quite interesting to watch lip biting. Lip biting is uh, uh, because of a, a chemical change in the brain. And um, when we see people becoming hostile, you'll see them biting their lips and licking their lips quite ferociously. Again, it's a sign of hostility. So just watch for people. They're looking at you, arms folded comes in, the vision becomes locked on you. They start licking and biting their lips and the hand goes to the back of the neck. The neck. And I hope you recognize from here that it's quite a high risk um, situation and that's we can see these type of things all within our 10 meter range so if you are within 10 meters and somebody approaches you positionally is 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 a key area that we positionally need to to react to your positions are critical so i'm going to ask you to think about how you position yourself when somebody approaches you and one of the aspects that i want you to consider on this is that we you always 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 maintain two arm distances if you stand within two arm distances of of somebody your peripheral vision becomes active which effectively means that you can see the full mechanism of the body and if you look at this arm this picture here on the right where they're shaking hands here if you notice it's uh approximately two arm distances and that's a great position because this lady then can see the whole body and what that does is allow her to see any hands going into pockets uh any any movement so you never ever break down two arm distances when you first meet somebody and it's also critical as well is that you actually we start to um do what we call out of arc so i'm going to get rid of this for a moment Okay. It's also very important that you stand out of arc. Um, remember that we what we've discussed is that um, humans, uh, their main core defense area is their, their stomach. Uh, and that's where we have to protect at all times. So this area here is what we call the arc. This is the area that you must protect. Yeah, the arc in here. So the minimum you do when you get approached by somebody on the street, a street beggar, somebody asking for change, somebody asking for directions, is to actually stand to the side. You must stand to the side uh, of the person. And that's critical. And what that does is, is it, it introduces three things. You're able to um, assess their body fully. They, it's very difficult then for move to compromise you and the third thing is is psychologically you make them feel a lot more uh, comfortable because you're not actually stood directly in their arc which is what this arrow here is indicating okay so before we come to some to finish and ask you you know for a few questions um, we always look one of the things we always ask is when we do our programs on corporate travel risk is We'll get a phone call and they'll say, uh, we've got staff traveling into um, Africa, for example. 
And the first thing I say to them is, um, okay, so what's your policy and procedures? And suddenly there's a silence on the phone. And often a, a mixture of good quality corporate travel risk is, is creating a culture of safety and a culture of mixing policy versus um, sustained and trained methods so that your corporate profile matches the the skills of your people actually operating on the ground and so they're trained to watch for situations and also trained to work within your policy and procedure and that's critical uh, and often that is not looked at a travel management company which books your flights and your chauffeurs is not a risk company it doesn't often identify the risks for you when you are uh, some of the risks that you may face from um, situations and to finalize uh, before we come to some questions uh, we spoke about Mexico and people uh, you know have been held up and shot been shot at and all those difficult things 99.9% .9 of the times people will never ever come across situations like that unless you're in a country of high risk but what the question I will ask you all is have you ever had sunburn Yep, and I could probably, if I was watching you, probably hands would go up and yes. And have you ever carried suntan lotion? And have you ever carried after sun? So often we prepare for hot weather and hot climates, but we don't prepare for some of the risks that we may come across in some of the major cities around the world where some of your colleagues and people operate as a corporate level. Okay, so I'm going to come on to some questions now. Thank you very much for that, Andy. That was um, very informative. If anyone's got any questions, if you'd like to pop them in the chat function on the right-hand side of the screen, we'll, we'll spend uh, five, ten minutes now going through those. I've also popped a link in there to a written resource on the same topic which Andy has provided for us that's available to download from the IIRSM website. And I've also popped um, Andy's email address in the chat function as well in case any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask him directly um, after this webinar. So um, whilst we're waiting for some questions to come through, um, Andy, would you like to tell us about the travel safety programme that Cardinus run, which provides training in this in this topic area? Yeah, sure. Well, we, we provide um, um, training in all aspects of some of the, the areas that we've discussed now. Again, we're more proactive. So what we do is we, we design the program specifically for your clients. So some of our clients at the moment are McLaren Formula One Racing. We work with the world's uh, biggest logistics company. I've just been asked to write a strategy for South America. So everything is bespoke uh, and um, keyed to your type of operation. So uh, everything we spoke about there is we review the policy to make sure that you are um, compliant with legislation and then we designed to create a culture of safety and that's how we design our programs and are they quite focused on um role play and and sort of active learning sure. yeah, yeah they're, they're very interactive we actually take people from having no idea of how to read people right up to picking people up in crowds where we use video inserts and um, watch to watch people we take them down some of the 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 most hostile locations in the world in a car and they pick out information and risks so from no skills at all we pick them out and our motto is see what we see so we train people to watch people uh, uh, and to see what we look for right, we've got a question from julian who's asked do you have a template for a policy or is there a list of key factors yeah, that should we, be included we provide, we, uh, yeah Julian, if you, if you need a, a template for a policy, please just email me uh, or Holly and we'll provide you with a, with a template for a policy that you can look at. So that, that's by all means, that's um, yeah, very achievable. So please just either Holly or myself and we'll get that to you. Right, I think we've got a couple of more questions coming through. Thank <laughs> you. 
see we've got lots of people typing right here we go so gary um do you have a list of for a medical kit or does it depend on the country region no gary um yeah we can provide you with a, a medical list again i mean if, if there's um certain clotting agents called Celox now and i think it works out about five dollars a pack many years ago if we had um, a bleed an arterial bleed and this can go for construction sites or, or, or anything um, um we used to obviously try and put tourniquets on but now you can buy a little pack of Celox, which is a powder which clots the blood immediately so yes i can provide you with medical kits um depending on regions um that's a really good question so when we're operating in South Africa, where the gun crime is high, or in Mexico, where the gun crime is high, we offer trauma packs, for example. And those trauma packs are mainly to deal with knife or gunshot wounds. So they can be hostile uh, medical packs, and it can be non-hostile packs, if that makes sense. But please drop me a line, or Holly, and we can get you a list. Okay. And then we've just had another question in from Balakrishnan, who's asked about um, taxi precautions. So what precautions need to be taken when you're hiring a local taxi from the roads? Yeah, no, that's a, a really good question. Um, and what we say is, if you can remember me talking about what colour are the police uniforms, one of your pre-planning checks is to check what are the state registered taxis, what's the colour of the state registered taxis. And so most countries in the world have um, registered taxis with the local authorities or the state, which means they have to issue receipts, there is designated pricing tariffs, and they're obviously the drivers are um regulated and so one of the things that may be part of your policy is that you build up a portfolio of what um the designated taxi colors are so for example in dubai um the taxis in dubai have um pink roofs which are designated for ladies on their own um i know a lot of people use uber which is a fantastic facility but i would suggest that some of your policy is that uber shouldn't be used overseas and only designated colors taxis and again this pre-planning we can advise on those type of things but it's a really good question okay i think that's all of the um questions that we've got for now i'll send around a follow-up email this afternoon again with andy's details on and um, a link to the recording and to the written document which cover some of this information as well and if you've got any questions then um, please do get in touch andy thank you very much thank you good